UQ has the world-class programs and great facilities. Sehingga nanti dengan memberikan kesempatan kepada putri saya untuk bersekolah di luar negeri itu akan membuka wawasannya dan juga sekaligus menambah kepercayaan diri. I've always been fascinated by the human mind and what motivates behavior. That's why I chose to study psychology at the University of Queensland. It's a program that offers more than 50 undergraduate courses, understanding how people behave, think and feel. And it's all taught right here at one of the most prestigious schools of psychology in Australia. With the support of award-winning teachers and researchers, I'm able to push the boundaries of my knowledge and participate in cutting-edge research. I'm also part of a community of peers with dedicated psychology support tutors to support me throughout the program. In my final honours year, I have the option to complete my own research project or combine a team research project with practical experience in the field, helping to build my skills in critical thinking and communication to prepare me for a range of pathways after I graduate. And it all adds up to a degree with my future in mind. Own the unknown with the University of Queensland. I chose UQ because it's top 50 globally. Uh, di sini Raja uh, menjadi mandiri dan very very independent. I thought about going into a place where I could hone my critical thinking skills and discover new things. Good afternoon, Bapak dan Ibu attendees. Selamat sore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today in this webinar. And also, we would like to thank PSSE, the SPK School Association, for sharing the invitation for you all to attend. My name is Irma Irshad. I'm the Principal Business Development Manager from Queensland Government Office in Indonesia, or we also known as Trade and Investment Queensland, or short for TIQ. As a background, TIQ is a Queensland Government Agency that connect Queensland and Indonesia, and we are here to promote Queensland capabilities in Indonesia from our Jakarta's office. Our presenter today is Dr. Dennis O'Hara, and today you'll be hearing about key aspects of effective therapeutic communication. Dr. O'Hara is a clinical senior lecturer, counseling and mental health, school of nursing, midwifery, and social work from University of Queensland, also known as UQ. And we also have Mbak Titria Arsianti, the principal advisor, Southeast Asia. And we also have Mbak Nadia Sartipas. She's the senior principal advisor from, uh, they're both from UK office in Jakarta. Um, some, okay. Um, some housekeeping rules before we start. Uh, your speaker is already on mute. Uh, for any question, please do tap them in in the question and box, a uh, question and answer box below your screen, and our presenter will try to uh, answer those questions towards the end of this session. And this session also will be recorded for educational purpose. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to hand the screen over to Mbak Fitri Arsianti to say a few words on behalf of uh, University of Queensland in Asia. So over to you, Mbak Fitri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mbak Irma. Good afternoon, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Thank you very much for attending the seminar. Um, I'm Fitria, as introduced by Mbak Irma, and uh, together with Mbak Nadia, we are UQ, who's based in Indonesia. 
A little bit of background that this seminar is a, set, a collaborative work between GIQ, uh, SPK, and UQ. That's a very big thank you for the three of us and Prof. Dennis O'Hara, uh, UQ. I would like to briefly introduce UQ. So um, globally, we are top 50 in the world uh, ranked. And nationally, we are GOA, which is one of the top best university in Australia. Where recently, Times Higher Education also ranked us as number two in Australia. Um, in regards of our expertise uh, in mental health, uh, psychology, and counseling, we rank number 32 in the world and some of the courses that we have includes a Bachelor of Psychological Science Honors, Master of Mental Health, Master of Counseling and Master of Psychology. Um, UQ students will get access to our 24 seven counseling supports online and offline and free of charge. That is free of charge, including 30 face-to-face -face, uh, counseling sessions. So um, we really, really um, looking into the importance of the mental health of the students, the mental health of the staff, um, and that. UQ would also really like to collaboratively work with high schools. And both Nadia and I uh, are here in country to support that. So lastly, I really hope that you will enjoy the seminar and that it would provide valuable knowledge that can be applied. Thank you and enjoy. Over to you, Ma Irma. Thank you so much, Ma Fit, uh, Bapak dan Ibu Atendis. Uh, an overview of the topic of uh, our seminar today, of our webinar today. Effective communication in any context always involves making genuine contact with the listener. This may be this may seem obvious, but how do we connect with others, especially children and adolescents? We often focus on what we want to say instead of why we want to say what we want to say. Real connection emerges out of being personally genuine and finding the reason why we are relating together. Children and adolescents are seeking real connection and hence schools provide an exciting opportunity for students' personal growth and development through shared connection with teachers, counselors, and other caring professionals. And Bapak dan Ibu attendees, a bit of information of our presenter. Dr. O'Hara is the program lead for the Master of Counseling within the School of Nursing, Midway Free and Social Work. He is a chartered psychologist with the British Psychological Society and member of the Psychotherapist and Counselor Federation of Australia. Finally, I'm going to turn to our speaker now, uh, Dr. Dennis O'Hara. Dennis, thank you so much for being our speaker today for your information. Uh, and I'm sure you're already aware that most of our attendees here today are education counselors, teachers, um, a few of school principals, and a few of school foundation members. And we all here uh, all excited to hear what uh, will be presented today. And hopefully we could uh, take away some of the key learnings today to be applied to our daily interactions with studio, students at schools. So without further delay, Dennis, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elma. Uh, and um, thank you, everybody, for the invitation, uh, the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting little challenge because uh, obviously I'm not in Indonesia, and um, it's always good if you can get, get a, a, a much greater sense of the audience in front of you. But um, um, Petria and, and Elma and Nadia have been very helpful in um, providing me with a bit of context as well. So I, I uh, appreciate that and, and hope I do um, uh, hit the right notes in, as far as uh, the, the needs within your own school setting. Um, maybe just a few introductory thoughts about myself. Um, I've had a, uh, a longish career now and uh, I actually started uh, as a teacher, a school teacher and was in schools in both primary and secondary um, many years ago now. 
but um, was there for quite some time. And I uh, very much value that uh, experience and that growth period, actually. I, I think one of the greatest things I learned um, as a teacher was how to connect with with uh, the, uh, the students and uh, how important it is to be relatable uh, with, with the students. So and not only that, I think the other marvelous thing about um, being a teacher is you learn about learning uh, and you know pedagogy and how to sequence uh, ideas and how to how not just to present information but to connect with the students with the information. Um, so I really value that. I, I um, then went on to study further in, in educational psychology and counseling which was a sort of a bit of a natural um, progression, I think, or trajectory over the years. And then um, spent most of the last 25 years or so very much specialising in the inner counselling, counselling psychology field, both here and overseas. So I'm going to share the screen and let's see if I can get that sharing working. Always a challenge, I find. Um, and would you believe I can't find my, oh, here we go. That's the one. And just better go back to the beginning. All right, I'm just going to move this around a little bit. Oops, Daisy. That's not. Looks like I'm having trouble just with a little bit of the sharing. We'll try it again. Can you all see that now? It's working. Good. Yes. Yes. All good. It's working. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, um, just a, a brief overview, I think, would be helpful here. And so, um, just moving this cursor around. There we go. Um, just to give you a bit of a, a sense of where I'm going, I wanted to, apart from the brief personal introduction, I wanted to um, also just recognize uh, right from the outset that I want to be as aware as I possibly can of our different cultural settings. So I've had a range of experiences across different countries, but it doesn't necessarily mean I've got a good grasp of your setting. And I, and, um, so, I want to recognize that some of my own assumptions aren't always correct. And um, so I just ask that you be uh, generous and patient with me if, I'm, if I don't always appreciate the, the, uh, the, the same cultural perspectives on a, on a few things, but I think we'll, I think we'll be pretty close. Um, overview wise, these are the sorts of things I want to cover. Um, I've just given them some headings. So appreciating context within the school setting. What is counselling? How do we even make sense of that, especially within school context? What do students need from counsellors and what are the most uh, uh, pressing presenting problems? Of course, communication, the therapeutic relationship, the person of the counsellor and the teacher, the effectiveness of school counselling, and then we'll see where we get to from there. That's a fair bit to cover anyway. So let's see how far we get. Okay, so appreciating uh, the context in which we're working. Where and when do we do the counselling? Well, well, you know, we've, the context is really critical in, this, in the school setting. So we've got 
primary age children, small children. Then we've got adolescents, and of course, counseling is conducted with adults as well. And each of these developmentally are different. So we have to be a very aware of the developmental variations that we have to um, meet when we're working with anybody, but certainly when we're applying a, a counseling practice. But counseling can also be in other settings, community services, hospitals, private practice, and all those contexts are a little bit different. My note before about societal uh, context as well, and you could make a whole talk on this, of course, but just two points I thought that I just want to doff the hat at, and that is in certain cultural settings and certain um, organisational settings, some are more hierarchical than others, some have much flatter structures, uh, all of those sorts of cultural and uh, subcultural variations definitely impact how we can engage. So that's that's a point of note. And also the degree, the, the potential for personal agency or, or autonomy, if you like, also influences the engagement factor as well. So if, if a student doesn't feel, for example, that they've, they're allowed to say much, uh, they, they, they feel a bit constrained, that influences how we have to engage with them. But I would say the same thing for an adult coming to counselling as well. Some feel very free to say things and others don't. So my first question is maybe defining terms a little bit. What do we even mean by counselling? I mean, I, in some ways, it's a funny question because we, I think in some sense we assume, well, we know what counselling is, but do we really? I think it's actually quite a tricky question. And again, it, it varies a bit uh, depending on context. Here are some examples, not meant to be exhaustive, but counselling can be seen as active, deep listening, emotional, psychological support, so journeying alongside of someone. It can be seen as advice giving. It can be seen as principally a sort of a problem or solution focused enterprise where we're, we're going to provide an answer for something. It could be career guidance. Um, it could be symptom management. I've got certain symptoms of anxiety or depression or something else. And um, through counseling, we might manage those symptoms. Notice that symptom management doesn't necessarily imply solution to the underlying cause, but it means management of the immediate day-to-day -day experience. It, counseling might mean personal empowerment, and it also might mean deep therapeutic change, a much deeper level of, of personal change. And I suppose the list could go on there. And I, I would just ask you all to have a look at that list and just think about counselling from your own perspective, you'll probably pick a few of those, but you'll tend towards two or three of those more than others, I suggest. Uh, and that might vary depending on the setting you're in so and the role that you have. So if you're working with primary age children as opposed to adolescents and maybe university students, for example, um, that maybe the focus might be slightly different. But what do you think counselling is? Um, it, it's, it can be all those things, but there'll tend to be a dominant theme running through your own perspective and, your, and the perspective of your uh, setting, your context. So but here's my point. What we think counselling is actually determines our approach. So if we think it's principally deep listening, that'll influence the approach that we take. If we think it's principally uh, symptom management, that'll be a different approach. And I could, we could talk about theories there, but it's, it's more than theories. It's a, it's a whole way of conceptualizing. Okay, so what do students need 
and want. Um, well, guess what? They probably want all the same things we just listed. So they probably want um, our counsellors and teachers and even our school administrators to be active listeners, uh, to, be, to be able to provide some emotional psychological support, at least in, at some level, maybe to give advice. And you can see the list going on. Um, what are we in a position to provide, I suppose, is one of our big questions. Again, that depends a bit on your role, but what are we in a position to provide and what's the, the environment able to provide? Now, an example here is um, not every single school in Australia, for example, uh, unfortunately, in my view, uh, has a school counsellor. Um, a lot do, but not all of them do. So teachers are the front line, of course, and I'm very sympathetic to teachers who seem to have, I don't know how many hats they have to wear, but certainly one of their hats sometimes is going to be counsellor, even if that's not their principal role. So context affects what we can do. And the reality is we can't do all of this. We, we, that's too much for any, any single uh, professional to provide. Uh, and so we do, have, in many ways, have to prioritise uh, what we can manage. So I want to just talk about what do students need? And we can think about that from lots of different angles. Um, some of you might be familiar with the research from two quite well-known researchers now. They've been working in this area for ooh, 20, 30 years, uh, DC and Ryan. And they suggest that, um, you know, one of the big tasks, obviously, of school-age students is, is ongoing identity development. Who, who am I in the world? And if, if you, you can go back to people like um, Eric Erickson in psychosocial development, you know, uh, where Ed and Erickson, of course, started from birth and went through to old age. And even if you think about preschool age um, children, even a two or three year old, one of the early tasks, according to Erickson, well, the first task, in fact, was to gain or develop a sense of trust, trust versus mistrust was Ericsson's notion, of course. And then after that came autonomy, uh, autonomy versus shame and doubt. And if you think about the two-year-old, of course, the two-year-old who stamps their feet and says no, um, which all two-year-olds should do at some point, uh, is really doing a little bit of practicing their autonomy, saying, I'm not you, I'm me, and this is what I'd want. Now, obviously, we have to uh, manage that, but the idea is okay. But that theme of autonomy is ever-present, so it, it, it looks a certain way when you're two or three years old. It looks a bit different when you're seven. It looks a bit different when you're 12 and when you're 16 and then into adulthood. But it's an important need that we as human beings have. And when DC and Ryan looked at Erickson's stages, you know, the psychosocial stages, they noticed three overarching themes coming through. Obviously, one of them was autonomy that I've just sort of outlined. But another is mastery or what's sometimes called competence. And um, if you think about Erickson, you, you talk about the, the industry stage. This is the example of mastery and competence. And at all stages, we're wanting relationships. So if we break it down, we could say that human development, the human person throughout life may be expressed in different ways throughout life, but nevertheless is always present, are these three fundamental human needs of personal autonomy, mastery or competence of being good at something or several things, and of course, uh, connection in relationships. So what do we, just to sharpen that up a little bit, when we talk about autonomy, we're not talking about just the freedom to 
make a choice to do something. It's a bit more than that. It's about making choices that we feel motivated to, to make in a free and wholehearted way. Um, sometimes we choose things because we have to. That's not so much what we're talking about. We're talking about the motivation to act on our desires, healthy desires. Um, mastery, as I've mentioned, is about competence, about curiosity, about extending our capacity and relatedness, connecting with others, but also not just connecting with others, our, with our genuine self, but also offering ourselves to others as well in service and connection. So if we start at this point, autonomy, mastery, and relationships, and think about the school setting, we as teachers, as counsellors, one of our fundamental tasks is to support this development that helps students develop in these and meet these uh, developmental needs of autonomy, mastery and relationships. And um, I think in many respects, one of the measures of our success is when students reach their various milestones, how much have they been able to gain these basic needs? Now, let's put all that a different way. Just let's break it down a bit more simply. And I think, again, this is not meant to be exhaustive, but it should give us something to um, hang our hat on, and that is saying these needs another way. What do students need? They need a place to belong. And obviously they belong in their family and they belong in their wider community context. But we're talking about the school setting. They, they need to be able to feel like they belong there, that they are safe there, that they're comfortable there. And I think schools are tricky places. And some kids, because of various reasons, um, feel naturally as though they belong, are very comfortable in the school setting. And other kids don't. They, they don't feel safe at school or they don't feel that like they fit in very well for a host of reasons. But it's an absolutely incredible human need to feel as though we belong somewhere. Another need is to be heard, or to put it in a slightly different way, to be met, to, be, um, to have our own life and experiences validated, to say, yeah, that really is you, that really happened to you, this is what you're experiencing. Uh, without judgment, without criticism, but just to be heard and to be met. Another one is connection. And I wanna make a point here that I think sometimes we can default to thinking of connection as principally a cognitive exercise, whereas really deep connection is really more of an emotional and somatic, you know, a body experience of being connected with another person. We need, or students need practical support that might be for things like their curriculum, their learning, uh, psychological issues, obviously, relationships, whole host of practical needs. And the last one here, encouragement to take their own genuine action. I mean, this, is, this is very much the autonomy factor. So encouragement to be free to be genuine in themselves and to act into their world. Um, not reactively, but proactively. So again, the question is, if we think about our school, how are our kids going? Do they feel like they belong? Do they feel like they're heard and met? Do they feel connected? Do they feel like they've got practical support? And are they free to take genuine action? appropriate action in their life. So hold all of that in mind because, of course, we all well know that while that, those needs are there and they're all genuine human needs, it doesn't always work out so well. And so there are many presenting problems that we all see as teachers and counsellors in school. And when you think about the, the most common and recurring problems, this list 
it comes to mind. And again, it's not exhaustive, but uh, anxiety is a very uh, common presenting issue, a problem. Relationship issues, you know, think about kids um, feeling bullied or kids not connecting with other kids, kids feeling out of the group. Um, hugely important issue for, for students. Belonging, as I said before. Um, depression, despair. Learning difficulties is a, is a real issue and dealing with trauma experiences of, of, of many kinds. And the list goes on, but they're, they're, they're really top billing, important and common uh, issues that we in the school setting come across every day. So it's a real challenge for us. How do we meet these sorts of needs? Just to link you in with a little bit of the research, here are a few reasons why school counselling is effective. And the first one is, and this comes from a study uh, in the UK, first, for about three quarters of clients or students in schools, counselling seemed to be of value because it helped them get things off their chest. It might sound like a very ordinary everyday thing, but actually getting something off your chest, the burden of your struggle uh, with someone who you feel safe to share it with is enormously comforting. A second reason that counselling is successful uh, in this study was two-thirds of students said that the counselling was helpful because uh, of the advice that they had received. And this was mainly with respect to relating to others. So there's the relationship one, uh, um, ignoring bullies, learning ways to deal with stress. Um, an example might be working with their timetable. Very practical. Third, uh, for about 60% of students, the counselling seemed to have been helpful because the ways they had developed of relating to the counsellor. And that's a really interesting one. Think about that one. It was helpful because the, it's almost like the learning about relating they had with the counsellor through the relating, not just through instruction, but through the relating with the counsellor. And it said, in particular, trusting and opening up. And when they learnt and experienced this with the counsellor, they were able, more able to generalise that experience to other significant relationships. And finally, around 40% of students said that the counselling had helped them to develop insight into themselves and into their situations, uh, which then helped them identify and choose more effective ways of behaving. Um, I've got a reference to, uh, for this at the end of the PowerPoint. So there are some thoughts about the, the everyday sort of impact of counselling within a school setting. And just another comment, what, what were some of the change processes that enabled some of this? Well, relief, that was, I think, very much associated with getting it off your chest, you know, your burdens off your chest. Um, uh, and developing or increasing self-worth, we said developing insight, enhancing coping strategies, and improving relational skills. So if we can facilitate such change, we're doing pretty well. Of course, the question then is, well, that's great, and that information's, uh, you know, useful, but how do we do it? Well, which brings us to our real topic, how do we do all this? <clears throat> well, the first thing we need to say, and this, this is so um, absolutely strong in all the research literature about counselling and about any change process, and that is the centrality of the therapeutic relationship. And this is all really about how we connect with the other. Now, I want to make a point here. While I'm... I'm interchanging language around counselling and teaching. And while it's principally about counselling in terms of some of these skills, actually, it's, it's the same for teaching. The relational skills that a counsellor, that a good, effective counsellor has in terms of the basics are the same skills that a, an effective teacher has. An effective teacher is good at connecting. 
an effective counsellor is good at connecting. And I, I want to give an example of this. Many years ago, when I was actually transitioning, almost transitioning out of the school setting, I um, noticed something that was a bit peculiar. And at the time, I noticed that a, there were about oh, half a dozen physical education teachers who had retrained as counsellors. And I thought, well, that's rather interesting. How come there's so many physical education teachers retraining as counsellors? And I knew a lot of them. And uh, I could, and I knew that they would be very good at what they did, both as teachers and as counsellors. And it struck me. The, there are two, I, um, you, you might um, agree or disagree with this, but there are, I think, two types of physical education teachers, broadly speaking. One type is loves all of the physical stuff and loves getting um, trophies and getting results and getting records and and pushing hard and loves all the the uh, skill development and all that, which is all great and fun and kids like it too. Um, and they're high demand um, uh, in their focus. And then there's another type of phys ed teacher who likes that physical stuff too, but happens to be very good at relating by nature. And if you think about it, a phys ed teacher is often on the oval outside and not in four walls of the classroom. And if you ever wanted a, 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 an environment where children can get a bit uh, out of hand, it will be outside. And you can approach that as a very strict disciplinarian, or you can approach that from a point of view of connection. And what, what I noticed was that those, those physical education teachers who later became counsellors were all very good outside with the students on the oval, outside the classroom, not because they were heavy-handed disciplinarians, but because they were very good at connecting and had good relationships with the students. They could still do their discipline, but it, it came through a different avenue. So there's a, a little side note. Um, ultimately, the point being made here is that the person of the counsellor, the person of the teacher, is more important than, than what the counsellor or the teacher knows. So this brings us to communication in a different way. We can have good technical communication skills and still not connect. We can have the technical, you know, labelling of language around communication and still not connect that well. We need both. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the technical bit and then come back to the relational connection side of it because the two are, need to go hand in hand. And this is um, a what we might call in counselling or communication studies, the micro skills hierarchy. And we start at the bottom with attending and observing. And we attend uh, to ourselves. How, how are we presenting? What do we look like? Um, you know, what's our facial expression, our body posture and so on? And we're observing the student. We're observing what's happening for the other person. So we're, we're really sharp and paying attention. And then we need to know how to be encouraging in a conversation. We need to know how to paraphrase and summarise um, units of communication. We need to know how to reflect feelings in the, in the communication. And we might call these the basic listening skills, or the basic listening sequence. More advanced skills are confronting the other person, and that's not meant to be in a heavy-handed way, but in a, in a way that brings new information. We need to know what to focus on in a conversation. We need to know how to pick up on the, the real meaning that's important, and we need to pull all of these skills in a, together in a seamless way. No, no, uh, easy feat really. So a few thoughts about the, the basic listening, encouraging, paraphrasing and summarising. Encouragers can simply be a, a nod of understanding. It might be an a mm-hmm, uh-huh. You, know, uh you know, a lot of times in a conversation, our biggest problem is, is ourselves. We get in the way. We're too, we talk too much and we need not to talk so much. Um, 
speaking as a as a teacher, and I still teach, of course. Um, teachers love to talk. Actually, that's one of the reasons why we're teachers. We love getting up and talking. Um, Counselors need to talk a lot less. We need to do a lot more listening rather than talking. So encouragers uh, might simply be uh, little moments of saying, yes, we're listening, keep going. Um, and it should be very natural. Minimal encouragers have the effect of telling the other that we are listening, interested, and tracking with what they're saying. And a paraphrase takes that a bit further. It's picking up a, a slightly bigger unit of communication, something like a little phrase that someone said, and you offer it back. Again, as naturally as possible. And one of the great things about uh, a paraphrase, and it sounds like the, the simplest thing to do, it's, it's surprisingly profound. When we offer the person's words back to them or close to their words back to them, appropriately timed, what the person actually hears is, you are really, not only are you listening, you are really getting what I'm saying. You are really interested in me. And again, we haven't said very much, but the other person feels like uh, an enormous amount is happening. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Many years ago, I was uh, had a, a, an ad adult client who, um, came in with a fairly terrible story and she was a bit nervous and hadn't been to counselling before. And so when she came in, she just started talking. I mean, when I say started talking, she really started talking. She just talked and talked. And um, she was getting her story out. And I'm sitting in the chair opposite her thinking, I better say something. I should be saying something. I was doing my ahas and minimal encourages and very much trying to get a paraphrase out. And I've managed a few here and there but not too much, but I was very attentive. At the end of the session, she was walking out the door and she turned to me and said, what you said today was so helpful. And I remember being completely bemused by this because I thought I'd hardly said anything. But in her experience, I was so present to her that she felt like I had pearls of wisdom and I've said very little. So it's a, it's a rather interesting um, point of note that it's about not so much what we say, but how we are present to the other. Now, obviously we've got open and closed questions. I think most of you are very familiar with that. Uh, an open question is structured in such a way that it encourages the responder to provide an expanded response. So. You might ask a question like, what are your thoughts on the latest job proposal? And the person could say lots of things about that. Why did you find visiting your cousin difficult? And again, they could say lots of things. Whereas a closed question really only allows for a very clipped short answer. For example, do you like the, uh, did you like the latest job proposal? Well, my answer might simply be yes or no. Uh, did you find your visit to your cousin difficult? Well, yes, I did. It doesn't encourage an, an expansion of what was happening for the person. So the point here is the quality of an answer depends largely on the quality of the question. So I think there's a tendency for us sometimes to ask too many closed questions. There's a place for them, but we, there is a bit of a danger that we ask too many of them. Now this last one, and I'll pause on the basic listening sequence and the skills here after this, but reflection of feeling. And I think this one is one of the most difficult skills. Um, and whenever we're in a genuine conversation, there will always be emotion present in some form or other, whether it's a happy emotion, a sad emotion, an angry emotion, whatever it might be, but it will be present in some way. So the purpose of reflection of feeling is to make these uh, feelings more, uh, these implicit feelings more explicit uh, so that they are maybe clearer to the person themselves. Now, I, I want to qualify something here, and this is, I think, where we often misunderstand this skill and, this, and the place of this in deep communication. We often think if we can provide a label to what someone said, 
an emotion label, then we've reflected feeling. And that's not necessarily true. So here's an example. We might offer, I wonder if you're angry. Now, that's an okay question or comment, but it really will depend on how that's delivered as to whether it's reflecting the person's anger or just labelling it, which is different. If, that, if we were just labelling it, it stays a cognitive uh, focus. What about the other alternative? It feels like you're really ticked off. Is that right? Uh, I assume you use the phrase ticked off in, in Indone Indonesia, but um, uh, it's more colloquial. And, and I think that approach is closer to the actual feeling or the emotion. So we're not so interested in the label as in us feeling it and reflecting the feeling back because that can help the person be in touch with that. So when you're talking with your kids, with the students, are we giving information or are we reflecting what their experience is? Notice the big difference. Are we giving information? There's a place for that. Or are we just reflecting or are we offering back their experience? Okay, so we've got the basic listening sequence. And here, and in, from my perspective, if we do those pretty well, we're going to do well. Um, they seem very everyday, ordinary things, and they actually are. But to do them well uh, is not as easy as it sounds. But if we can do that, it, it, it will make an enormous difference. Of course, once if we can do that, then we can add more advanced skills later on. And I, I'm not going to delve into those particularly at this point. So there are different ways of sort of trying to categorise listening, but this is a simple and useful um, diagram or construction. Obviously, we first receive the information from the speaker, from the student. Our first job is to try and understand what they're saying. And then the next job actually is, believe it or not, is to remember the key bits. Um, usually there's a lot to take in sometimes. So what are the key bits? This is part of the focusing aspect. Then we have to evaluate, well, what are we going to do with that? How do we respond to that? We have to work out what are the priorities here? And then we have to respond in a way that is going to be received. We could respond, but will it be received? So we've got to evaluate how we can respond in a way that it will be received. That's our, that's our big task. And um, we've got, um, you know, some sequences we can look at here. When I, I, we don't have time to develop this, but just briefly, the first real task in a counselling or, or a teacher-student um, interaction is to connect empathetically, is to establish the relationship. Then we want to hear their story, what they're wanting to say. We're wanting then to go to what are, the, what are we wanting to do here? What are the goals? How do we work with this story to achieve the goals? What actions do we actually take? But notice our starting point is an empathic relationship. So I want there's some skills, there's some process. I want to come back to the therapeutic relationship, which again, as I said, is also the student-teacher relationship as well. And I said earlier that research has consistently demonstrated the significance of the therapeutic relation to therapeutic outcomes. It's not so much your clever strategies, they're good. What's more important is the relationship. And the relationship is actually made up of several key factors. If the starting point is empathy, but then the next part is the bond or the, the emotional connection with the other person. Then it is to establish an agreement on goals. What are we focusing on? What are we wanting to, to achieve? And then how are we going to do it? This is the tasks. So the ability of the therapist to connect with the 
student, the client, is sometimes referred to as attunement. And I really like that word. It's one of my favourite words. And I'll tell you why. It's simply because it's very um, descriptive in itself. It's, it's musical. And, of course, if you listen to a melody and there is a harmony that goes with it, then the harmony and the melody are in sync and they're in tune. They are attuned. But if they're slightly out, it's a horrible feeling. It's a, it makes you physically feel uncomfortable. And that's what we need to pay attention to. How are we in tune? So attunement begins with empathy, but goes beyond the experience of empathy to include the communication of empathy. In other words, to be connected so that they know that we're with them. Um, there's a quote there which I, I won't read. I'm aware of time. There's one other step, though. We can have, uh, we can be attuned so that we're empathetic and connected, but then we've still got to respond. So responsiveness is also part of our counselling research and the therapist's ability to achieve optimal benefit for the student, in our case, is by adjusting responses to the current state of the student and the interaction, not just giving them information or what we think they should know or think they should have. We're responding to what they actually need. Um, and the point is that when, when as someone feels accurately responded to, they feel less anxious more able to risk sharing their thoughts and feelings and move towards their goals, in this case, therapeutic goals. So establishing and clarifying goals is an important aspect of relationships and responsiveness. How the counsellor and student work towards these goals is the task is really important. Are, are we in agreement? And really the relationship depends significantly on whether counsellor, student, teacher, student have an agreement on goals and tasks, assuming we've already got a bond, a connection. So some points to uh, reflect on. Connecting with another always has an emotional, somatic, you know, body feeling element. Um, self, other, there's always going to be an affective, an emotional uh, aspect to it. it. It always is the case. So a good question to ask oneself as a counsellor, as a teacher is, what's happening for me in this relationship? What am I experiencing? But also attend to your own experience of the other as well. So it's self and other at the same time. Now, um, I thought I'd just finish briefly uh, with a comment, and I don't have time to develop it particularly, but a little bit of neuroscience, uh, and that is that we have in our neurology a, a, an inbuilt system of connection and an inbuilt system of protection, so connection and protection. And it looks something like this if we, we talk about the polyvagal theory, but basically the Connection bit is when we are flowing with the other person, we feel safe, we're in a social environment that's comfortable, our face is open. This is um, where we mostly want to be. But we've got a sympathetic nervous system which says, hey, if you're in danger, you need to act, you need to fight or flee. And kids will do that in the playground, as we all know well and truly. But equally, there's another one, and if they feel very seriously threatened, think of trauma experiences or, or, or in intensive bullying, for example, then the, it's more than fight or flight that, this, that the um, neurological system uh, engages. It now engages the immobilization system. And the immobilization system shuts the body down and we go into freeze. So at the top, we've got safety, connect, social connection, flow, 
in the sympathetic nervous system, we've got a bit of chaos, but it's okay. We're going to fight or flee, and that's all right. And if it's very dangerous, we're going to shut down or freeze. Now, think about that in terms of what are your kids experiencing in the classroom? Are they flowing? Are they in fight or flight? Or maybe sometimes when they don't get things, they might be in freeze. I remember as a, I don't know what I was, about a 12, 13-year-old, I was learning French and I was not getting it and I was quite upset. And I remember my brain just did not work at all because I was just so upset that I wasn't understanding this French. I was moving into the immobilization space and a good teacher should have encouraged me back up into flow. Well, we, another name for all this is the window of tolerance. And um, the flow state is in the middle, window of tolerance, grounded, flexible, connected in the moment, emotionally self-regulating. If we're hyper-aroused, we're in fight or flight, we're a bit chaotic. And if we're in that freeze direction, we're under-aroused, and we're feeling numb, shut down, depressed, and so on, maybe in a shame state even. As teachers, as, as counsellors, we've got to recognise this. And our aim is to keep our students, in when they're with us, in the window of tolerance, in that safe flow space. So I could say a lot more about that. Uh, we give whole talks on that. But um, how do we do that? We do it by connecting. We help the students stay in that space, that flow uh, state, by the bond that we create, by listening deeply to them, responding to the moment-by-moment moment need of the student, not necessarily other expectations. So in conclusion, effective therapeutic communication has a skills component. You can do those micro skills. They're important. But more importantly, it has an attitudinal and relational component. If we're able to establish a therapeutic bond, an identification of goals and tasks, and attune with the other, effective outcomes are highly likely. This will create a wonderful environment, not only in the counselling room, but in, this school, in the classroom and actually in the whole school. So our the final question to ask, I think the, the ongoing question to ask is, what does this student or the other need in this moment? There are some references. And at this point, I'll pause and um, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. It's very insightful. Uh, I learned a ton today, the ability to uh, connect with the client. So the students are just like client, yeah? they like to be listened to and uh, attend, attended to. So uh, Bapak dan Ibu attendees, we do have a few, um, some time left for the question and answer session. Let's move on to uh, the questions. If you have any question, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Okay, we do have a question, Dennis. Okay. Um, first question. This is an interesting one from Ibu Wiwit Krismani from Batari School. Ibu Wiwit asks um, steps in changing students to be better without changing their character and identity through this therapeutic communication. So the steps to help yes, them uh, change, but not necessarily. Yeah. Sorry. OK. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you got a question, yeah? Sorry? Uh, you've got the question, Dennis? Um, I can't see it on the screen, but uh, I think I've got it in my head. 
Okay, it's in the chat. Okay, I will be in that. It's in the chat. So why um, steps in changing students to be better without changing character and identity through this therapeutic communication? Well, I think the um, the very first one, you know, notice when, we, when I mentioned the therapeutic relationship. Um, if you think about it, I'm sure you've all had this experience and, and you see it all the time. You know when students towards the end of um, the year are uh, choosing subjects, this maybe fits better with the secondary school context, but the, the example works across the board here. If you think about students wanting to choose their subjects for the following year, and they might be choosing, you know, sort of maths or science or history or whatever it might be. Now, it's not uncommon, and I've heard this many times over the years, often the student's question is this, who is teaching the subject? They're not necessarily asking the question, what's the subject like? They're asking, who's teaching it? And I think that's a, a rather big giveaway. Uh, in that what they're really asking is, I might be interested in that subject, but I'm, what I'm really interested in, is there gonna be a good experience learning that subject with that teacher? And so the very first question that the student is asking is, what's it gonna be like to be with the other person? And this is the, to use the sort of the research language, this is the, the bond or the attachment, if you like, with the other person. And if they feel as though that the teacher is someone that they can be comfortable with, that they can, that they can have a, a decent relationship with, then we're, we're, all, we're already halfway there. After that, the, the relationship's always gonna be tested in some form or other. Now, it might be, um, when the student doesn't get their homework done in time, or it might be when they're a bit um, stressed out and they're, they're a bit naughty, um, or when simply we didn't understand what they said and they were frustrated by our response. So really the next part of it is if we've got a, established a good bond relationship, then really what we need to be able to do is to say, what is, what is it? that they're needing from me at this moment. Now, a lot of times, um, and if you think about classroom discipline, classroom discipline is a good one. Um, there was a, a, a theory of many years ago, um, and it comes out of a particular school of psychology, but was followed up by uh, a, a German researcher by the name of Droikus, and some of you might have studied this when you did your teaching degree. Um, and what he found was that in the notion of students wanting to belong, and they want to belong in their classroom, and they want to belong in their school, but let's, stay, let's stick with the classroom, um, they want to feel as though they are comfortable and safe and belonging there. So if a student is feeling a little bit unsure, one of the first things that they will do is... Um, ask you lots of questions or wriggle around a bit and, and, in other words, vie for attention. So they really want you to notice me, notice me. And it might be by asking lots of questions. It might be just by being a bit sort of, you know, un, unsettled. Now, the good teacher, the good counsellor picks that up and gives them a little bit of attention. Now, the attention might not even be verbal. It might be just going and standing next to them. It's, it's just an intuitive point of connection. If, that, if we don't give them the, if we don't respond, here's the responsiveness idea, if we don't respond to their need, Droik has said that um, they, the next step, will the student will ramp up their need for attention and um, they will vie for a bit of power. 
So they'll want to have a, they'll make it a bit more difficult for you as a teacher in the classroom, be, be, be a little bit extra naughty. Or if they're in the counseling room, they'll be a bit resistant. They'll, uh, they won't necessarily play the game very easily. Um, again, if we can meet them there and respond, they will settle down, they feel as though they belong, and things will start to work. Um, Droikas actually then went on to say, and if we still miss it, that's us, that's us, the teachers and the counsellors, if we still miss it, another, there's two other potential responses. One is the student will seek revenge. In other words, they'll really make it hard for us. They'll give us a really hard time. Or they'll become incredibly despondent. They'll just give up. And you can, and we've all seen students in the classroom just gone like this. They've given up. It's too hard. No, one's, I'm not getting it. No one's listening to me. Um, so we go back to the, the relationship, establish the relationship, the bond, respond to the need that's their need right now. Work with what do we need to go? What's the goal here? And how do we get there, the task? They're the sorts of questions we've got to keep in mind all the time, whether it were the teacher in the room or the counsellor in the room. I hope that went some way to answering that question. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I hope, uh, we hope that answered your question, Ibu Vivit. Uh, thank you for the, the great question. The next question, Dennis, is, well, lately it's, it's uh, getting more and more uh, happening in, in schools in Indonesia. Uh, Ibu Asna Yuliati, her question is how to help the victim of bullying in elementary school and how to help the bully in elementary school to stop the behavior without attention or punishment. This is also kids seeking attention. Dennis, how about you? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and from two angles, of course. Um, there's been a fair bit of research on this whole question of, of um, bullying, and, and so there's probably more than I can say in the time we've got, but a couple of thoughts about it. Um, one of the, so there is, a, there is a bit of a tendency for some personality style or trait type tendencies. I don't mean you're born to be a bully or anything like that, but you know, some kids are more naturally confident in their space than others, and some, you know, some are more extroverted, some are more naturally introverted, and so on. So there is a, a predisposition towards moving in certain directions if the environment then takes it and, and uh, you know, in a, in, it pushes it in a certain direction, of course. If we talk, firstly, and that's true for the bullied and the bully uh, or the bullying, um, the the person who's being bullied has a tendency to um, internalise the struggle and, and just hold it and manage it themselves, but not externally. The trouble with that is um, it doesn't put any boundaries around the interaction, the behaviour of the other. And so that usually the person who's bullied is not that good at setting boundaries um, and they just tend to internalise. So they, and the result of that is that they lose a lot of their own autonomy that we were talking about earlier, their own self-efficacy, if you like, um, and don't know how to see themselves as a person of some uh, healthy empowerment. The bully, on the other hand, um, wants to feel safe. I mean, they both want to feel safe, but they do it in a different way. The bully wants to feel safe by taking control. So if they can control their environment, and one way to do that is to, to diminish others, to push them down, then I feel in control. And if I feel in control, I feel safe. Um, then that's a good strategy. Well, at least it seems like a good strategy from their point of view, um, but it's not obviously socially acceptable. You'll notice, of course, and we all know this, when someone who has been bullied learns how to set their boundaries and, and stop the bully uh, by their own assertiveness and a 
healthy assertiveness, the bully gets very confused because you've changed the rules. So both have a need for safety, but they do it in different ways. The, the person being bullied needs to learn to externalise, not go into the dive, but go into a bit more of the sympathetic fight flight, but not fight for the heck of it, but to assert their energy and to see themselves well. In other words, have a good self-image, self, good self-esteem. So they need encouragement in that area and learning in that area and some strategies. The bully um, needs some empathy, obviously, but they also need to find out that the environment is safe if they don't exercise all this, let's call it manipulative control. So they are safe, they are likeable, if they, even if they don't do this. Um, and they need to learn to respect people's boundaries. Now, counsellors and teachers can do a lot of work and very good work in both those directions, whether for the person being bullied to lift their self-esteem, help them with boundaries, help them to externalise, and they can work with the need for increased empathy and a sense of safety too, but in a different sort of way, and for the bully and to learn uh, to respect other people's boundaries. Um, I've just, um, I can't hear very well there, Emma, but I can oh. see the next question. So the, the next one there seems to be the, um, the, the how to help and talk and help primary students who stole others' belongings uh, through the communication. Um, and how to talk to parents because they tend to defend their child. Yes. <laughs> um, I think I think again, the a lot of times I, I would put a developmental window on this one because I think what motivates the primary age child for something like that to steal some others' belonging is different. In many ways from the secondary uh, school student. They're developmentally in a different space. Um, the, the, the primary school kid, I think often is much more, who steals, is much more motivated by having a sense of deficit in their world that some, I don't have. I mean, that's what they, they want. There's something they don't have. And now, what they don't have might be um, a sense of belonging or a sense of safety or a sense of uh, recognition, being seen. So I think if we go with the idea of deficit, it's a, and it could be a deficit in a range of ways, it's a very useful way of thinking about it. Um, I think also... They need to learn, again, empathy comes in again, of course, because they need to see what would it be like for the other person. And um, we could certainly uh, talk to them about what if someone stole your favourite toy or something, what would that be like? Uh, so they need to approach this notion of empathy more. And don't forget that empathy is a very, very advanced, um, I'll call it, um, state of being and skill it's both it's not just a skill it's a state of being because to be empathetic you have to imagine what it's like to be the other person so it's quite an advanced capacity so primary age kids haven't always gained that yet so they need to learn some of that as far as working with parents go i think one of the things that i'd be talking about there is is, is getting rid of the blame question uh, the blame thing will will get people into a defensive mode. So 
if we start from the point of view of, I wonder what they were, what, what the stealing symbolizes. If you use it, the language of symbol rather than the object stolen per se, it's, I wonder what is, wonder, wonder what's the meaning of that, you know, that sort of thing. And, and it's almost offer the question as a curiosity. Oh, that's an interesting, you know, I wonder what that stealing means, you know. Uh, that will take away the defensiveness from the parent and that might get them rather curious themselves, which is the great starting point. Um, there's a next question there about the micro skills pyramid and confronting. Uh, all right. So let me, yeah, let me, I didn't develop that because of time, but what do we mean by confronting? Um, the, what I mean, actually, I think a wonderful definition of confronting within a sort of therapeutic context is offering a hunch. Well, that might sound like confronting at all, does it? But if you think about it, off, offering a hunch is actually offering an idea beyond what the person has already said at any point. In other words, it's introducing an additional thought that hasn't been present in the conversation. So I might, um, so let's think of a scenario in a school setting. Um, if, if a student um, consistently submitted their work late, that's a, not an uncommon experience. I've got a dog barking out there. Um, the, we might, we could say, look, here are the rules. You've broken the rules and now you're going to get punished. You're going to get demerits. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. And this is how it works. Now, there's a place for that, of course. But if we're talking more therapeutically, what we might say is, you know, I'm just wondering, there must be something going on because this is, looks like a pattern. You seem to be putting things in light on a fairly regular basis. So I'm just wondering, wonder what's happening. Why would that be the case? What's, what's going on with this? Now, I might even go a bit further if I've got a hunch and offer a thought about it. Um, but notice I haven't come in all boots and all. Uh, I've come in with, here's another thought, and I'm wondering. And so if you think of confronting more as going beyond what's already been said or present in the, in the known situation, then that's closer to the meaning in a therapeutic sense. Now, of course, there's always the other version of confronting, whereas this is not good, don't do it. <laughs> there is always a place for that. How are we going with time? Yeah, Mark, I can answer a few more. But... Dennis, uh, we'll, we're finishing at 4.25, so we'll still have about eight, uh, eight minutes left. Okay. So I'm just looking at the next question. Um, from Theresa, Theresa, um, about this student who hardly speaks. Um, the home environment is very strict, and there's he speaks with a fairly high pitched voice. Right. Obviously, I'm not in the situation, but I can I, I can offer a, a what might be an element here. If you think about the fancy term in communication studies, would be prosody, which means you know the sort of the tone, the pitch, the pace of speech. Um, when it's high pitched, unless there's some physical thing going on, um, it tends to imply high levels of anxiety. So they're not speaking much, so they're 
potentially fearful. When they do speak, it's high pitched. So there's your anxiety factor. And so much so that others don't even seem to be able to understand them that well. Um, wow. So, and we've got this very strict environment in the home setting. I firstly would wonder, is there more going on beyond just being a bit strict? So is this, is this student, you know, is their daily experience one of fear? And, um, you know, I'm, I, um, I'm old enough <laughs> um, to have been at school when we, when I, and particularly in a boys' school, uh, when I got the cane most days of the week. This is like 50 plus years ago. So um, it was very commonplace when I was a kid. And we had, I remember in my grade eight year, we had uh, spelling, 10 spellings every day. And for every spelling you got wrong, you got the cane. So if you got six spellings wrong, you knew for sure that morning you were going to get six on the hand or on the backside even. There was one boy in the class who got the majority wrong every day. That kid, when he came to school, was shaking. He was so nervous. And it wasn't because he was a bad kid. He had a learning difficulty. Now, thankfully, we're a bit more informed these days than 50 years ago. But um, what a terrible thing. But that, that sort of environment can be recreated in other ways, from the home environment or wider environment. And it will tend to show itself in a host of physiological ways. I, that would be my first suspicion. And so my first response would be to really want to spend time with him and to connect with that kid um, to allow him to find some level of calm, get back into that window of tolerance. I, I, that's probably about all I can say at the moment on that. Um, can we use therapeutic communication in the group? Uh, in a classroom as a student who get, get blamed by a classmates for everything. Oh, um, yeah. That, again, depends a bit on the age group there as to how that's going to function. That, I, I, just a thought on that one. This is getting very therapeutic now uh, on that one. Um, you might have heard of the term um, projection or transference. To use more everyday language, uh, we could use the term expectation. And I, there seems to be a, a, a transference or, a, or an expectation that that's produces a pattern. There seems to be a pattern here. Um, has always got an energy attached to it. So transference is an energetic communication. That's a good definition. The communication mightn't be with a lot of words necessarily, but it's still a communication, you know, non-verbals and the rest. So um, a transference, we will, here's a, here's a big maxim in therapy. A transference will first be felt before it's thought. And so if the student, and this is two ways, of course, but if the student is projecting, transferring, having an expectation that's got a high energy to it about I'm going to be not worthwhile, I'm going to be picked on, I'm useless. The other students will go, not necessarily consciously, they'll go, okay, yep, we can do that. Now, it doesn't, doesn't take the responsibility off the other students but um, understanding the dynamic is very useful, but and also from both ends, from the student who's maybe in trouble, and also the students who need to behave better around that student, have some empathy. I would spend some time with both groups probably at some point, 
um, and see where that takes us. But again, time doesn't allow. But there's a thought about the subtlety of our expectations and how it can affect, um, if you want to use a really confronting word, how it can defile the environment. So there's a thought. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, sadly, that would be our last question. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, I'm conscious of the time. So thank you very much for being our speaker today, Dennis, especially for our attendees today, Baba and Ibu attendees. Thank you very much for staying with us until the end of the webinar. And thank you for all the great questions. And we hope that uh, the information that Dennis has provided today is useful. Um, we will send an email that will include the link uh, to a survey. Appreciate if you could fill in the survey. Uh, so for those who, who, who did, uh, we, will send, uh, we will send the recording of the webinar, uh, also the copy of the slides. And uh, please do fill the survey in so we could uh, improve our session with you in the future. And uh, in that email also included uh, UQ contact details or, and our office. So if you have any question or need to get in touch with us, uh, you'll be able to do so. Uh, before we all let you go, uh, if we could take a quick photo of everybody here today, uh, if I could get you to open up your camera if you haven't, but Nadia will help me to take the snap with us all. Thank you, Banat. Are we ready, Banat? Okay. Yes. Give Ish. your best oh. smile, everyone. One, two, three. Next, we have a lot of uh, people here. And the last one, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Manat, uh, Bapa dan Ibu. Thank you again for joining us uh, today. We're signing out. Uh, stay, stay safe, stay healthy, and be happy. Terima kasih banyak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye now. The future is the great unknown. One day, we'll turn our plastic problems into worm food. We're doing that. One day, we'll unlock the secret to helping more kids finish school. She literally wrote the book. One day, we'll build thriving businesses before we even work in one. We've already got seed funding. The future is the great unknown. And the best time to own the unknown is now. The University of Queensland. Going into the course, I was just interested in sort of updating my resume and getting some new skills. Um, but the way it was presented and the knowledge that I gained from even individual classes, I found just enhanced um, myself as a practitioner. And I guess something else that surprised me about the course um, was how much I learned um, with, uh, with my fellow students um, and really pushing myself to um, develop a greater understanding um, from psychology. So from my time at UQ, I think the best thing I learnt um, was an integrated neuropsychology framework um, that really invites um, me as a clinician to, to identify the need of the client um, and then to apply appropriate theories and responses to that. One of the course coordinators, Judith Murray, um, presented a 10 questions of loss framework. Um, and that really developed, I guess, some core skills for myself to be able to sit with people in, in loss and in grief and to provide that uh, further level of support and care. Going through this course has helped the way I communicate, the way I speak to my wife, the way I uh, speak to friends and family. It's really encouraging.